started. All right, so what we are going to do today is we're going to listen to a radio story that is um, on your, it's, we have a, a Google Classroom assignment for the day called, uh, what is a dare to be great situation? So does anyone have any ideas of what a dare to be great situation might be? Anyone, anyone? Okay, well, I want you to think about that while we listen to this. So there's nothing to watch. Um, I'm going to share my, how do I do that here? I don't know. Um, okay, I'm gonna share my screen and we will go to the uh, Google Classroom assignment and uh, go from there, so, all right. So what is a dare to be great situation? So we're gonna do some writing in Boom Rider about this at the end of class. But what we're gonna do now is, I already have it up. Uh, this is basically um, <clears throat> the transcript, which means the written out version of what we're gonna listen to. Um, but I will go ahead. Okay, now I can share computer sound. So, and I understand um, from the last class that uh, sometimes the sound cuts out and so on and so forth. So you can listen to this on your own if you would like to. This is the MP3 uh, file. So just click on that and your computer should play it for you. Um, I recommend following along on the transcript. It just helps you kind of um, reinforce what you're hearing by reading it as well. It strengthens your reading skills. So, um, okay, we will go ahead and take a listen. Well, look at that. <laughs> Maybe not. Um, maybe I already have it up. Let's double. From NPR News, this is All Things Considered. I'm Melissa Block. And I'm Robert Siegel. Okay, can you all hear that? Let me get the chat up, so. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. Okay. Over here, I'll move this over here. <laughs> All right, let's continue. When the Vietnam War ended and Saigon fell in April 1975, Americans got their enduring impression of the event from television. Good evening. A quarter century of American involvement in South Vietnam is over. At mid-afternoon, Saigon time, an armada of 81 U.S. Marine helicopters descended on the South Vietnamese capital, more than 6,000 persons, as many as 900 of them Americans, the rest Vietnamese and third country nationals, were evacuated. Plucked from the U.S. Embassy grounds, from rooftops throughout the city, and from the nearby Tonsonut Airport. But there was another evacuation that didn't get news coverage. U.S. Navy ships saved another 20 to 30,000 Vietnamese refugees. The full scope of this humanitarian rescue has been largely untold, lost in time and in bitterness over the Vietnam War. But correspondent Joseph Shapiro and producer Sandra Bartlett from NPR's investigative unit interviewed more than 20 American and Vietnamese eyewitnesses. And they studied hundreds of documents, photographs, and other records, including many never made public before. 
Here's Joseph Shapiro with part one of our report and the story of one small U.S. Navy ship. On the morning of April 29, 1975, the USS Kirk and its crew stood off the coast of South Vietnam in the South China Sea. As I'm sure you know by this time, Vietnam has surrendered and uh, the mass uh, panic, almost panic-stricken uh, retreat has already taken place. Sitting on his bunk, the ship's chief engineer, Hugh Doyle, records a cassette tape to send home to his wife, Judy. It's, I really don't know where to start. It's been such a couple days uh, where we fit in it was, was really interesting. You're probably not going to believe half the things I tell you, but believe me, they are all true. Doyle's cassette tapes, which until now have never been heard publicly, provide one of the extraordinary humanitarian missions in the history of the U.S. Navy. The Kirk's military mission that day was to shoot down any North Vietnamese jets that might try to stop U.S. Marine helicopters as they evacuated people from Saigon. The North Vietnamese planes never came, but the Kirk's mission was about to change, and suddenly. Doyle told Judy what he and his crewmates saw when they looked towards South Vietnam, some 12 miles away. We looked up at the horizon, though, and pretty soon all you could see were, were helicopters. And they came and just, it was incredible. I don't think I'll ever see anything like it again. It looked like bees flying all over the place, you know, trying to find some place to land. Paul Jacobs was captain of the Kirk. Every one of those Hueys probably had 15 to 20 people on board. But they're all headed east, you know, trying to escape. Kent Chipman, a 21-year-old Texan, worked in the engine room. What was freaky, and it still, it gives me goosebumps to today. It'd be real quiet and calm and not a sound. And then all of a sudden, you could hear the helicopter coming. They just, you'd hear the big choop, 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 choop of the Hueys. These were South Vietnamese Huey helicopters. Military pilots had crammed their aircraft with family and friends and flown out to the South China Sea. They were pretty sure that the U.S. Navy's 7th Fleet was in that ocean somewhere. Now they were desperately looking for some place to land. Here's Hugh Doyle speaking today. Well, they, they, were, they were flying out to sea. Some of them were very low on fuel, and th some of them were crashing alongside uh, the larger ships. Uh, they were crashing in the water, and, and I don't know how many Vietnamese uh, refugees were lost in all that. But the helicopters flew past the Kirk. They were looking for a large carrier deck to land. Jim Bongard, a radar man, was watching all the traffic dotting the radar scope when Captain Jacobs issued orders. The skipper got real excited. He called down to us and said, you need to try to advertise and see if you can get these guys on the radio. Just announcing our hull number and we have an open flight deck. If you want to come land on us, we can take you aboard and that kind of thing. You know, just trying to encourage them to come in. There was one problem. It wasn't clear that the pilots could land on a moving ship. Don Cox was an anti-submarine equipment officer. Most of the Vietnamese pilots had never landed on board a ship before. Almost to a man, they were Army pilots, and they typically landed either at fire zones, you know, little clearings in the brush, or at an airport. And the ship looks very, very small, and the uh, deck was very crowded. Cox was one of the sailors who, not sure if those pilots would land or crash, stood on the flight deck to direct the helicopters in. The first two helicopters landed safely, but then there was no more room. The Kirk was a destroyer escort. It was built to hunt submarines, not land helicopters. It had a landing deck about the size of a tennis court. Uh, I believe it was the third aircraft landed and chopped the tail off the second aircraft that had landed. There was still helicopters circling, wanting to land, there was no room on our deck, so we just started pushing helicopters overboard. We figured humans were much more important than the hardware. So we couldn't think of what else to do, and these other planes were looking for a place to land, and, you know, we would have lost people in the plane, so we threw the airplane over the side. <laughs> yeah, really. As one helicopter landed and the people scrambled off, dozens of sailors ran over to push the aircraft over the side and into the ocean. But Ken Chipman says it wasn't easy. The Vietnamese helicopters were heavy, and because they were designed to land in fields, they had skids instead of wheels. The flight deck has nine skid on it. I mean, it's like real rough sandpaper. And the Hueys didn't have tires on. They had like skids. And we'd have to just work it this way and work it that way till we got it over to the edge. And then everybody, there'd be like 30 people just fighting their way to get over there and try to help, you know. With one final shove, 
the helicopter would totter over the edge of the ship with its tail high in the air and then crash to the water below. There were stories, horrible stories that they, I've heard from the refugees. One Vietnamese pilot landed with bullet holes in his aircraft. Hugh Doyle saw he was in shock. As he was loading his helicopter, had his family killed. They were standing there waiting to get on the helicopter. His family was machine gunned. He was in, in the helicopter. He was the pilot. He stood there and looked at them. They were all laying dead. The crew of the Kirk fed the refugees and spread out tarps to protect them from the blazing sun. We took the people up onto the O2 level, just behind our stack, and we, uh, we laid mats and all kinds of blankets and stuff out on the deck for their babies. And there were all kinds of, there were infants and children and women, and there was, the women were crying, and oh, it was, a, it was a scene I'll never forget. Kent Chipman. These people are coming out of there with nothing. Whatever they had in their pockets or hands, some of them had suitcases, some of them had a, a bag. You know, you could tell they'd been in a war. They were still wounded. There were people, young, old, army guys with uh, bandages on their head, arms. You could tell they'd been in a fight. Some of the pilots and their families came from Vietnam's elite, and some of them carried what was left of their wealth in wafers of gold, sometimes sewn into their clothes. The captain locked the gold in his safe. Then there was the helicopter that was too big to land. This is when the big Chinook came out, and you could tell the sound of it was different, more robust, deep. This huge helicopter called a Chinook, it's a Boeing. You know, remember down from my, my mother's house, the Bertal place? Those, you know those huge helicopters they made down there? Those great big ones. Doyle had grown up in Pennsylvania near the factory that made those helicopters. They came out and tried to land on the ship. Oh, we almost, the thing almost crashed on board our ship. So uh, we finally got him to realize to wave him off. He was too big. You know, he, he just could not have landed. Well, he flew around us a couple times. And he was running low on fuel. Picture this. We're steaming along at about five knots. And this huge airplane comes in and hovers over the, over the fantail. Opened up its rear door started dropping people out of it. It's about 15 feet off the fantail. There's American sailors back on the fantail catching babies like basketballs. The helicopter wasn't stationary. It'd come in and hover and, you know, trying to get close as they could. I remember at least twice that he went back up, not real high, you know, 60 feet or so, and he'd slowly come back down. The helicopter was probably 8 to 10 foot in the air as off the deck as we were catching the people jumping out. They would kind of scooch out to the door and just kind of drop down, you know, as easily as they could. This, I mean, it's, the noise is tremendous. It's the biggest Chinook they make with the four sets of wheels. The wind off this thing, it's like being in a hurricane. One mother dropped her baby and her two young children toward the outstretched arms of the sailors below. I remember the baby coming out. You know, there was no way we we're going to let them hit the deck or drop them. We caught them. I was pretty small myself back then, weighed 130 pounds. Even as small as I am, uh, you know, they come flying out and we caught them. These were the Vietnamese Army pilot's children. He'd saved the lives of his passengers, but now he was out of fuel and surrounded by flat blue ocean. Hugh Doyle saw him fly the huge helicopter about 60 yards from the Kirk. Doyle used a slang and calls it an airplane. He took the airplane, hovered it very close to the water, took all his clothes off, with the exception of his skivvies, all by himself, no co-pilot, took all his clothes off, threw it out the window, and then he got up on the edge of the window, still holding on to the two sticks that the helicopter has to fly with. He tilted her on its side, still flying in the air, and dove into the water. The airplane just fell right into the water, hit the water on its right-hand side. The rotors just exploded. There were small pieces, but there are also pieces probably 10, 15 foot long, big pieces go flying out. It sounded like a giant train wreck, you know, in slow motion. And when it's loud, it's, you know, wind blowing everywhere. The Chinook ended up upside down. He dove out the side of it. The thing flipped upside down, and then it was calm and quiet again, like he turned off a light switch. I'm thinking, man, this guy just died. I said, this is crazy. And his little head popped out of the water. I said, he's alive. It was, it was pretty cool. The pilot's name was Bond Nguyen. He and his family were among some 200 refugees rescued from 16 helicopters. 
on the second day those refugees, more than half were women, children, and babies, would be moved to a larger transport ship. But the heroics of the Kirk would continue. Shortly before midnight, at the end of the second day, the Kirk's captain, Paul Jacobs, got a call. And that's when I get it on the shoulder from the XO. He says, hey, 7th Fleet wants to speak to you now, Sergeant. It was the admiral in charge of the entire rescue. He says, uh, well, we're going to have to send you back to rescue the Vietnamese Navy. We forgot them. And if they don't get them or any part of them, they're all probably going to be killed. The Kirk was being sent back to Vietnam. The South Vietnamese government had fallen. The communists were in control now. The Kirk would be headed into hostile territory by itself. So I said, am I going to get any support? No. Am I going to get any air cover? No. You're on your own. I said, what's the rules of engagement? He said, there are none. The Kirk set out to save the South Vietnamese Navy. And it ended up rescuing tens of thousands of desperate Vietnamese refugees. We'll tell you that story tomorrow on All Things Considered. Joseph Shapiro, NPR News. And you can experience the Kirk's dramatic story in photographs at our website, npr.org. So, um, <clears throat> this uh, ship in the U.S. Navy, the USS Kirk, um, was hanging out. It was supposed to, its official orders were to shoot down any uh, North Vietnamese um, planes or helicopters that were trying to harass the people leaving. Um, but there weren't any North Vietnamese planes or helicopters. So then they decided they saw all these helicopters coming out, but they were all South Vietnamese people uh, trying to, to escape and uh, get, uh, find a safe place to land their helicopters. And even though they were a small ship and it wasn't their official mission, they said, hey, you know what? We, we have an area you can land your helicopters. So land your helicopters here. And so they sent out a radio signal and people started landing their helicopters, but then suddenly there were too many helicopters on the ship. And so they had to uh, push the helicopters off of the plane or the ship into the ocean. Um, and that, you know, helicopters are very expensive pieces of machinery. <laughs> when you're in a, the military, you're taught to respect the helicopters. So the idea of just throwing them away into the ocean is kind of crazy. But uh, I believe they said something about, you know, humans being more important than machinery. Uh, but then this big old helicopter comes that is too big to land. Um, and what that big helicopter, it's called a Chinook, um, it basically hovered over and had everybody jump out and people caught them. Um, and then the um, helicopter pilot 
crashed the helicopter into the ocean um, and managed to jump out and survive. So it was a pretty um, miraculous situation. Um, as you could probably hear, the people who were involved very excited about it uh, and felt like they had done something great and they did do something great. So, um, okay, what we're gonna do now is watch a quick video that gives you guys more details about what we just watched. Okay. All right. The box. Oh, so yeah, I, I made this box for my dad uh, when he uh, retired from Boeing. A shirt, shorts, photographs, and memories very very special of a courageous father husband and helicopter pilot it's hard for me to put in words sometimes who risked everything for his family's freedom that's it this is how we started shorts and a shirt right and a, and a big dream it's a dream that began in crisis on april 29 1975 Saigon was falling to communist North Vietnamese forces. Ba Nguyen, then a South Vietnamese Air Force major, knew it was time to flee the country. He commandeered a CH-47, a huge twin-rotor Chinook, loaded aboard his wife, their three small children, and friends. He then headed out toward the Pacific Ocean, not knowing what to expect. My dad was afraid for not having enough fuel. He was just flying blind. And then he saw a ship out there. It was the USS Kirk, a Navy destroyer escort. The ship had already taken on refugees from smaller helicopters. But the Chinook was much too big to land on the ship. The crew waved him off. But determined to save his family, Ba Win maneuvered the helicopter over the stern so they could jump to the ship. His oldest son, six-year-old Mickey, jumped first. I jumped out, my brother jumped out, my mom was holding my, my sister. I thought, oh, please, God help me. With her right hand, holding on with her left to brace herself, you know, just dropped uh, my baby sister. That, that I never forget. You know, lucky whole family, you know, in the, the cellar. Really good catch. The drama was not over. After his family and other passengers made it onto the ship, Ba Win had to get himself out of the Chinook. He flew away from the ship, kept the aircraft hovering just above the water then somehow got out of his flight suit and jumped into the ocean as the helicopter crashed. And he pops up and he's alive. Incredibly, Boss survived without any injuries. A rescue boat picked him up and reunited him with his family. All he had left was his shirt, shorts, and hope for a chance at a new life without war. We have peace in the United States of America. All right. So, pretty crazy, huh? <laughs> so, what we are going to do now is we're going to do some writing in Boom Writer. Um, and the title of our writing is, What Does It Mean to Be in a Dare to Be Great Situation? And so what I define a dare to be great situation is, is something that uh, maybe you didn't choose, but suddenly you have the opportunity to be a hero or to save yourself and not worry about everyone else. 
Um, so I would say that uh, Bon Nguyen, the pilot who took his whole family out to um, the sea, not knowing what he was going to find, uh, and then was able to hover over the ship while his whole family and other passengers jumped out and then crashed the plane, the air, the helicopter into the ocean and survived. That was a dare to be great situation, right? Maybe that morning he said, you know what? This is too tough. We'll just all hang out here and see what happens. Um, and then the sailors who suddenly had babies being dropped on their um, deck. They, you know, imagine if you were there trying to catch one of those babies and you dropped it um, or you didn't catch it. Um, that would be really scary, right? Um, so there's also a, a chance that you could be a colossal failure and live with that horrible thought the rest of your life. Um, so these are situations, you do find them a lot in, in wartime situations, but um, there are dare to be great situations in everyday life. And so what I want you guys to do right now is go to, share my screen again. So we're going to go to what is a dare to be great situation assignment in Google Classroom. And there is a link to Boom Writer. So I want you to open that up and do some writing. And I will be here to help out if you need. <laughs> 